Greetings from the set of Metro and More at Metropolitan Community College, serving more than 50,000 students with over 120 programs at our eight locations in the daytime, evening, weekends, or online. Good afternoon, and hello and welcome to a special edition of Metro and More. I'm Amy Forrest, Professor of History at Metropolitan Community College in Omaha, Nebraska. Two months after Pearl Harbor occurred on December 7, 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Empowered with fear and motivated by anti-Japanese American bias already present in America prior to Pearl Harbor, the United States government deemed it was a military necessity to force approximately 120,000 Japanese American citizens, two-thirds of whom were born in the United States, into 10 internment camps located throughout the United States. Japanese Americans were held against their will in desolate prison camps run by armed military soldiers. Some of the Japanese Americans were incarcerated until World War II ended. With me today is Mr. Sam Mihara. He is a second generation Japanese American. Mr. Mihara and his family were imprisoned at Hart Mountain internment camp in northwestern Wyoming. They were held there until the end of the war. Mr. Mahara is here today to tell us his story. Mr. Mahara, it is an honor to welcome you to Metropolitan Community College. Thank you very much. If you would, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I was born and raised in San Francisco before the war. Um, I was uh, nine years old, and I can recall very clearly the environment uh, at that time, uh, just after uh, the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, all of us, I mean all of us, asked each other, you know, why? Why would Japan do such a thing? We had no idea. and. Uh, Several of the, the senior uh, Japanese were very concerned, uh, those especially who were not citizens, uh, by asking the question themselves, you know, what's going to happen to us since we don't have the rights of a, a citizen? And so uh, the time was very, very difficult for people of uh, Japanese ancestry. Mm. You have a video. Uh, of Senator Alan Simpson from Wyoming. And uh, we're going to cut away here for just a moment and show this. So then we were told there were 11,000 people there. Well, there were only two cities larger than that in Wyoming. That was Cheyenne and Casper. Powell was about 2,500, Cody probably 3,500. And so people thought, now if those people escape, we'll all be killed. Well, there were 11,000 of them there, and they were going to break out, and they'll come to town, and we'll be dead. Well, I, I know uh, Mr. Simpson, uh, senior Republican senator from Wyoming. Uh, he was a, uh, a teenager. The entire Simpson family uh, was a resident of Cody, Wyoming, and he remembered uh, precisely what it was like. Uh, and the video describes uh, the attitudes of the people uh, at that time. When they first heard there were 10,000 people of Japanese ancestry coming to uh, be their new neighbors right there in a small town of Cody. And so it was, uh, it was very refreshing to hear a local Wyoming uh, citizen describe the feelings of the local people there to our coming to the area. Mm. You know, you said 10,000 Japanese Americans, resident citizens, were coming to Cody. Do you know the population of Cody at that point? Uh, it was roughly uh, 3,000 people. So we were outnumbering them three to one. And uh, the smaller town of Powell, which is about 30 miles away to the northeast, uh, was even smaller, maybe about 1,000 people. Mm. And so the, the, the media did a terrible uh, disfavor by uh, uh, putting headlines and describing this this uh, massive influx of uh, of Japanese 
becoming their new neighbors like it were downtown Cody, and it's not the case. We were, the camp was located about 15 miles away from the, the heart of Cody, so we were a good distance away, but uh, uh, you would not know that knowing that the headline said there were uh, 10,000 of us coming here mm. as if it were downtown Cody, but mm. uh, the level of hysteria was very, very high. Yeah, I, I imagine that your reception <coughs> probably wasn't much of much of a reception. Okay, um, before before we get into that, I, I wanted to ask you really quickly. Um, before you were taken to Heart Mountain in Wyoming, and and you'd mentioned you were only nine mm -hmm. years of age, what was that like um, before? you were taken there. I mean, what, what was your life like before you were, I am assuming, taken by rail and then by bus to Heart Mountain? Um, just kind of describe your life before all of this got started. Well, the problem began much, much longer before uh, our family came to, to, uh, to uh, the United States. The cause of the problem of imprisonment was simply due to the racial hatred that existed uh, against all Asians, not unique to the Japanese, but the Chinese, Japanese, all Asians <clears throat> in the 1800s uh, when they were uh, hired by the railroad companies to help build the, the railroad that expanded to the West Coast. Uh, after the railroads were finished, most of them settled in uh, California. About 80 percent of the Japanese in the U.S. settled in California uh, and therefore in the late 1800s there was a, a, a very large hatred against people of Asian ancestry. So when Pearl Harbor took place uh, that focused directly then on the people of Japanese ancestry uh, in that state. Okay, so the, the Central Pacific, the Transcontinental Railroad, you're talking about afterwards that people were settling pretty much in California. When you say the problem, the racism, when did your family come? When did you, when did they start experiencing not a very nice reception? Well, our family history is probably uh, different uh, than a lot of other uh, Japanese immigrants. My father was uh, was very well educated. He majored uh, at a college in, in uh, Japan called the Waseda University, uh, which is somewhat comparable to, uh, to uh, Harvard uh, here in the U.S. And his major was in English, and so now he was very skilled in English and, of course, in Japanese. And so uh, he was in demand. His skills were in demand, and so he hired in uh, and immigrated from Japan uh, to San Francisco. He hired into a newspaper, a bilingual newspaper, and he was a, uh, a um, uh, I would call it a, a senior translator, uh, and he, he rose in that position uh, to be, become one of the executives in that newspaper. Um, as a result, uh, he was able to uh, uh, purchase a, a very comfortable house, uh, a uh, three-story Victorian house in San Francisco, uh, and uh, so we, we lived a very comfortable life uh, right there in the middle of uh, Japantown in San Francisco when this all occurred. Hmm. Can, can you explain what's Japantown? Uh, Japantown is a, uh, a community made up of uh, predominantly uh, Japanese uh, people of Japanese ancestry uh, and they elected to settle in this one particular part of San Francisco uh, and uh, uh, they moved into homes that existed, which are mostly Victorian-style homes uh, in the area. And uh, perhaps in a, in a cluster of about, uh, uh, about three blocks by three blocks uh, in the city, uh, that's where uh, many, many people of uh, Japanese ancestry uh, lived and worked. They had mom and pop stores uh, on the first street level uh, and um, then in the surrounding blocks they had homes and uh, my parents lived uh, and purchased and lived in one of those uh, very nice homes. Mm. 
So it's a three block by three block by three block area, and pretty much everyone is of Japanese descent. Precisely. Okay, right. and, and I'm assuming there's a lot of Japanese spoken, or not, not really? Well, it depends on the age level. Uh, our parents uh, and my grandparents uh, obviously spoke uh, uh, Japanese in the home. Uh, but uh, my father especially spoke English to me and my, and my brother. Uh, so, so we were literally bilingual in the house. Uh, and of course, I, I was going to grammar school and uh, I learned English. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, we were able to communicate both in English and in Japanese. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I'm just curious, was, was your dad doing that with a purpose or he was trying to, to help you, you know, assimilate and, and not, I mean, still have the Japanese and the English, but he didn't want you to lose culture, but at the same time, it's okay, we're in America, and, you know, we, we need to go forward? Uh, no, my, my father uh, uh, was, uh, he had a lot of foresight. He, he knew that uh, for his sons, my, myself and my brother, would, would have to um, become well-educated and, and head off to a career of our choice. So uh, he, he, was, uh, he allowed us to speak English to him as well as others. Uh, and at the same time, he tried his best to teach us some Japanese. Uh, so uh, uh, now we got along very, very well at that mm. time. Okay, so a very, a very smart man, and yeah. you're right, looking to the future. Okay, so I'm picturing you as a nine-year-old boy in this very nice neighborhood in a, in a beautiful Victorian house. And um, what's life like at school for you? Uh, are there any issues of racism, or is it pretty much everyone you go to school, you know, is from that area? Well, un until Pearl Harbor took place, uh, uh, our school was uh, a very diversified, which is unusual mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco. Our neighborhood, in particular, was made up of uh, of uh, young people of various races and religions. It was unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. To see, uh, a, in, fir in fact, the first the first group photo uh, that uh, the famous photographer Dorothea Lang took was a picture of the uh, grammar school uh, kids, um, and uh, many of my friends are in there. And uh, mm -hmm. just looking at the young kids, you can tell it was a very diversified school. Mm -hmm. uh, that was because of the nature of our neighborhood uh, at that time. Mm. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're you're getting a very well-rounded education. You're meeting people right. who don't necessarily look like you, right. and things are going well. And then Pearl Harbor, if you don't mind, can you kind of go back a little bit? How, what happened? Um, you, I'm sure you remember the day. Oh yes, very, okay. very clearly. Can, um, yeah, if you don't mind describing that, and then the concerns of everyone. Well, I remember the newspaper headlines uh, um, about Pearl Harbor taking place, and, and you know, my friends uh, all talked about, you know, where's Pearl Harbor? What's that all about? And why would they do such a thing? It was a, a total mystery. Now, that was on Sunday, December the 7th. On Monday morning, when we all went back to school, um, many teachers uh, initially started out with statements like, you people caused Pearl Harbor. I mean, imagine a teacher teaching racial hatred to the entire class. But that was not only one class, there were several classes where the teachers greeted us on Monday, December the 8th. Uh, and it was awful. Uh, but uh, our parents were very concerned because they were not, uh, they were not U.S. citizens at that time. And uh, they, they wondered, because they were not U.S. citizens, uh, they don't have the protections that we do as American citizens, so they wondered about, as to what will happen to them. You know, well, for example, uh, the government might deport them and leave the kids here in the country. Or, or, or maybe worse, that the entire families would be forced uh, back to Japan. So there was a lot of concern as to what's going to happen to us uh, at that time. Can you explain, I mean, your dad is obviously a very smart man. Why weren't they citizens? Why? I mean, I know the answer, but why, why weren't your parents, why weren't they citizens? Oh, uh, 
there was a, there was a law uh, passed that uh, prohibited uh, the uh, not only Japanese but uh, all Asians uh, from uh, receiving uh, and obtaining citizenship, uh, and that stood on the books for a long time. So uh, they were not allowed to become citizens, even though they were immigrated and. Uh, uh, they passed all the requirements of immigration, but still they were not allowed to become citizens in those days. Mm. So there's your parents. They're not allowed to become citizens n through no fault of their own. Mm. It's illegal. And they have children who are born in this country. And they sent you off to school on December 8th knowing that things might get a little sticky for you. So after your teachers started with you people, then what happened? Well, um, it wasn't too long before uh, President Roosevelt, on advice of his, uh, uh, of his advisors, uh, signed an executive order called 9066. And uh, in that order, it gave the authority to remove anyone in a military district. So by signing the order, which does not name the Japanese, it simply gives the authority to remove uh, to the military. And with that order, the military of each district in the U.S. can select those people to be removed. Now at this point, there was a couple of problems that came up. Uh, on the East Coast, there was a, a uh, Lieutenant General Hugh Drum, Hugh Drum, D-R-U-M, and, and he had a problem because there were many uh, German and Italian families on the East Coast. And he elected not to remove those families from the East Coast, even though the threat from the, the German submarines was worse on the East Coast than any similar threat on the West Coast. But regardless, uh, he, didn't, he decided not to remove uh, those people, mainly because uh, the industry complained that if those people are removed and can no longer work in their industry, um, the, the business would, would uh, suffer. And, and, and that plus other reasons, they, that General Drum decided not to do that for the East Coast. Um, in Hawaii, of all places, uh, a, a General Emmons in charge decided not to remove the Hawaiian uh, people who were Japanese ancestry, and 40% of the Hawaiians uh, in that time were Japanese. And one reason being the pineapple industry complained, if you remove those people, our industry would lose business because I won't have the workers to, to be able to uh, uh, prepare the pine pineapple products. But uh, on the West Coast, however, that is the states of uh, Washington, Oregon, and California, uh, there was a, uh, a military officer by the name of General John DeWitt, John DeWitt. And he decided uh, to remove the Japanese. And as one evidence of the fact that he was a racist, he hated anything to do with Jap Japanese, he, he, he declared a definition of who is a Japanese. And that definition is if you were one sixteenth blood, one sixteenth. That is, if you had one of your 16 great, great grandparents was Japanese, you are a Japanese and you shall be removed. Even though 15 sixteenth of their great, great grandparents would be white, it doesn't matter. That's his definition. So they removed orphans. They removed everyone considered to be Japanese by that definition. So he was clearly a racist, and that didn't occur in any other part of the country. So unfortunately, it was the Japanese who were the chosen people, and most of them, by the way, two-thirds of them were American citizens. So clearly our civil rights were denied by forcing us to re be removed and uh, by uh, the fact that uh, there was not even a hearing, not even a judicial process to determine uh, if we were guilty of any crimes. So that, that is the main cause uh, that uh, we claimed as being unconstitutional at that time. Mm. 
So um, we're not even going with the one drop rule. We're going with one sixteenth of a drop of blood. Oh right. my goodness. Yeah, right. that, that's definitely, yeah, a bit much. When was your family aware that you were going to be incarcerated? Well, what happened next was uh, uh, General DeWitt uh, issued several orders. Actually, I should say his staff prepared the orders. Uh, and for each district, for example, San Francisco was a district. Uh, he defined specific orders on uh, how we will be removed. Uh, and it, it included uh, a very dis distasteful items like uh, uh, our homes were, were searched uh, for any contraband. Uh, the, the bank accounts were all frozen. We couldn't touch our money. Uh, they had set curfew time. Uh, so we were under house arrest uh, starting at 8 o'clock in the evening until 6 in the morning. Um, and we were to report with only one suitcase, one hand carry, to take to the prison camp on a given day. We were given about two weeks notice and we were to report to a central uh, pickup point where the buses came to load all of the people of uh, Japanese ancestry uh, on that day. So let's see now. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. We've got um, our president, Franklin Delano mm -hmm. Roosevelt, who, if I remember correctly, about two months after Pearl Harbor is when he signed an executive order, obviously going above past the courts, the Congress, and is going to have people like DeWitt, even though the East Coast, the West, the uh, Hawaiians are not enforcing this, and how he's giving you about two weeks, and you're being told, um, and your houses are being searched for contraband. Okay, let, let's start with that one to begin with. Um, how did that work? How did, how did that happen? Do people in your three by three by three block, your, your Japan neighborhood, uh, they just came right through and just started going through people's homes and their belongings, and I'm assuming found no contraband. Oh, I remember uh, there were um, plain clothes officers. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were FBI or whether they were a local police, but uh, uh, they came right into the house, started searching. Uh, I don't recall that they showed any warrants or anything else that showed their, the, uh, the legal aspects of their search, but they came looking for, for items like uh, radios, uh, uh, even kitchen knives, uh, anything that might be of, of use, uh, cameras, uh, things that might be useful for people to conduct uh, either espionage or sabotage and, uh, and removing those. And uh, uh, we, most of us never saw those items again. Uh, I have friends who lost the entire sword collection, uh, Japanese swords, never saw them again. Uh, so, so that happened, that was one of the first things that happened uh, in, in this process. How did your parents react to that? Did they just step aside, let them in the house? I mean, what else, I guess, could they do? Yeah, you know, there was a problem. Um, our parents who were born and raised and educated in Japan uh, were taught in Japan that the government always makes good decisions. Don't challenge decisions made by the government. So the first generation people who were immigrants simply went along. They didn't complain. They, and uh, those of us who knew our rights, you know, we learned a lot in, in school. Uh, starting with the Pledge of Allegiance, we knew our rights, and therefore um, we would have complained, but well, what's a nine-year-old going to do? Is he going to go out and find a lawyer and file a lawsuit? No, no way. Mm -hmm. So we did what our parents did, that is to, uh, uh, if the government says, you know, do this or do that or remove things, we simply let them have their way without a lot of complaints. There were a few really few. Uh, there are famous uh, cases called the, the Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and Yasui cases. Mm. These three fellows were Japanese Americans who decided to avoid uh, going to these camps. 
and they took steps in order to try to avoid them and uh, unfortunately they failed uh, because the steps that they took involved breaking a law, the curfew law or uh, crossing the, the boundary law and so forth. So they all wound up in prison and uh, those cases failed in the Supreme Court uh, primarily because they admitted that they, were, they committed uh, crimes uh, at that time. Um, but later on uh, in the camp, uh, there was a, uh, an important lawsuit filed by an attorney in San Francisco, a white attorney named James Purcell, and he decided that um, it was unconstitutional. What he did was filed a lawsuit on behalf of a, a lady. Her name is uh, Mitsue Endo, and Mitsue Endo was selected because she had a perfect record had nothing to do with Japan, never been to Japan, never went to a school to learn about the Japanese history. Um, in fact, she worked for the state of California and, um, and uh, therefore uh, Mr. Purcell filed a lawsuit on her behalf after we were in the camps for three, three, for three years and um, uh, the Supreme Court finally uh, and unanimously nine to zero decided that it was unconstitutional and uh, the government uh, shall let the people go home and close the camps. So that was, that was the, uh, the most important case in my opinion as far as uh, uh, maintain, maintaining our rights, our civil rights and, uh, and making sure that the constitutional uh, rules uh, applied to us. And that certainly is a lesson that could be applied to other people. A very, very important case. The other, you said your homes were searched and your bank accounts were frozen. How do you live for two weeks when you have no bank account? Well, we had no choice but to do what we could to gather up money. Uh, the worst cases are people who had to sell their homes because they carried mortgages. They knew that if they left, there would be no way to, to, uh, to pay uh, for the loans that they had uh, they created, so a lot of people had forced sales of homes and everyone knows what happens if you have a forced sale. The prices go way down and you lose a lot of money, but that's what happened. My father, very, very uh, well educated and knew that hanging on to your house is the most important thing and so what he did was he found uh, a white friend in San Francisco uh, who took care of our house while we were gone and that worked out very, very good. So. Uh, uh, we were, we were relatively fortunate that we went, when we moved back into San Francisco, it was, um, uh, it was fairly smooth and it was not a, a disruption in our lives. Mm. Are you still in touch with that person or that person's family today? Uh, no, they're, they're, they're passed on. By the way, his, his name is uh, Harrison. He turns out to be, uh, a, uh, he was a, uh, a president of Hastings Law College in San Francisco. A very notable uh, fellow, and he and his wife were both well educated, and they took care of our home uh, mm. while we were gone. Mm. That's really exemplary mm. from them. So, your dad looks for the future. Thank goodness, your dad's a very forward thinking man. Yeah. And then the day comes, and you each have one suitcase. What did you put in your suitcase? Uh, I don't remember exactly what was put in, but I do remember they would not tell us where we were going. I had no idea we were going to go to uh, northern Wyoming, where the weather was awful during the winter. Um, and um, so I remember, you know, Mother just started helping pack things for us. Uh, but uh, I recall it was typically California clothing, which is by uh, the rest of the country standards, uh, it was relatively uh, light clothing. Uh, we had no idea that we would wind up uh, in, in areas that ran uh, minus 28 degrees below zero. It was awful that first winter. Mm. So you pack your suitcases mm -hmm. and then you went on a train? Yes, we all, we all got on a train. Well, our, our first, uh, the first way of going to the camps is, is on a bus. The bus came to San Francisco right in the heart of Japantown at a pickup point. And uh, now the, 
the uh, military guards are out in full force making sure we get on the bus. The kids were wearing dog tags uh, with their names and prisoner numbers. Uh, Dorothy Lang took some very, very uh, emotional photographs of families wearing, of kids wearing these dog tags to be put on to buses that sent them to the prison. Our first prison was not the, the permanent prison. Our first prison was uh, racetracks, horse racetracks in California, Oregon, and Washington. And they were closed for the duration of the war. And so the government um, converted these racetracks into temporary uh, prison camps by building barbed wire fences, guard towers, and soldiers with weapons. And we were placed in these temporary uh, camps in, uh, uh, in these racetracks. And the first people who went to these racetracks had to live in horse stalls. Uh, they were not well cleaned and, and properly prepared for us. But life in those horse stalls was absolutely terrible. And again, Dorothy Lang took many photographs of, of the life in these and these horse stalls. Uh, the day came though after three months when the trains now came to these horse stalls, uh, the horse racetracks, and then we piled on these trains uh, and now uh, the, the guards were shoulder to shoulder. One photograph that I use in my talks uh, shows a, a, a large, uh, literally, army of guards with weapons making sure that we get on that train and they stayed on the train with us until we got to our destination, which we found out was Heart Mountain, Wyoming, an awful place. And so, uh, so that's where, where our new home for, for three years uh, existed. Mm. So the, I'm gonna go back to the, the horse stalls. I, I think from what I read um, about you that your family ended up in, in an office space. It was not in the horse stalls, correct? Yeah, or our, our, uh, they ran out of horse stalls because there are mm -hmm. thousands of people going in where there's uh, only 100 horse stalls. So what they did was build uh, more shacks. They look like horse stalls, but right in front of the horse stalls, they built a lot of shacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember living in that, that, uh, those shacks with paper thin walls uh, it was not an easy time for, for us, and, and it was very compact. Uh, our family in a very, very small room uh, inside these, uh, these shacks uh, at that time. Mm. So how many in your family? Uh, in our immediate family, there were four, my parents and my brother and myself. Okay, and how big is this shack? I don't remember the dimensions. The, the, the room, the cell room size in uh, Heart Mountain, Wyoming, our room was uh, 20 feet by 20 feet. Uh, my recollection of the, uh, the shacks at, uh, at the horse race tracks were about the similar size. Uh, 20 feet by 20 feet, uh, barely room for, for four beds or four cots, uh, and uh, not much room for anything else. It was, no utilities except one light in the ceiling. Uh, and so uh, that was our home for, for three years in Wyoming. So, all right, what's a typical day for a, a nine-year-old boy in a tiny room that's just barely fitting cots? What do you do all day? Well, we, we try to live as, as most comfortably as we could. Um, the government tried to create literally a city, a, a small city with all of the uh, features that are available in, in a city. And now we're talking about 10,000 people. We had a uh, high school that was not finished, which we all worked on to get that high school finished. Uh, there were two, there were plans to build two elementary schools, but uh, the local people complained. They said, don't do that because why are you building new schools for prisoners when, when we who are not prisoners don't have new schools? And so they, de they decided to, the government decided to quit building any more schools so that the one high school they built and the rest of us in grammar schools had to uh, do with uh, a barracks. So we had to move people out of the barracks in order to make room for uh, classrooms inside the barracks. Uh, so that became our new uh, grammar school. So you did attend school mm -hmm 
five days a week, kind of, kind of quasi normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, who are the teachers? Uh, is it, are other p prisoners or teachers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the government relied on the prisoners to provide uh, their own uh, medical staff, their own teachers, uh, their own cooks. In fact, the, the camp only had 30 uh, white uh, staffers running it, and they had another 30 guards uh, protecting uh, this city of 10,000 people. Well, we soon found out there were not enough teachers, especially um, teachers with credentials so that we can be, uh, receive proper education. Uh, that would be recognized by colleges when we graduated from high school. So uh, we asked the government to, uh, to bring in more teachers, and they did. They brought in 33 white teachers from across the country. And uh, they lived with us the, inside the camp, inside the barracks, and uh, made their own food and uh, taught during the day. Uh, and so, so we had a group of, of teachers who were uh, either teachers' assistants or maybe a few qualified teachers. But the majority of the teachers who were qualified were hired uh, from outside. There were white teachers who came in and uh, lived with us. How about textbooks? Well, that's another story that's kind of interesting because uh, when, when we started school, there were no te textbooks. Um, and it turns out the, um, uh, the uh, religious groups outside the camp, um, uh, we, we asked them to help bring in more textbooks. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, uh, especially the, the uh, the National Friends uh, uh, religion, they, they were able to bring in uh, many textbooks, so we used, used textbooks to, to uh, fill in our, uh, our needs for, uh, for textbooks in the schools. Yeah, that worked out quite well. Hmm. So you've got 33 white teachers, you've got textbooks that a religious group is kind mm -hmm. enough to donate. Mm -hmm. Does anything else resemble school? Uh, are there sports? Are there clubs? Do you even have dances? Uh, is there anything that looks like school? Well, you know, we, we did all of the functions that a normal high school does, um, especially the sports. We had uh, football, baseball, basketball all year round. And um, the problem is we were not allowed to go outside the camp to, to compete. So what we arranged was all of the local communities with high schools brought their teams into the camp. Mm. And we had uh, football, baseball, basketball games inside the camp, which were very popular uh, among all the residents. So, uh, so uh, that was one thing. The other thing is, uh, that was important, uh, there was a sociological problem, um, especially with young people who have a lot of time on their hands. And, and so the parents recognized this problem. And so they created uh, many social activities. Uh, for example, we had uh, 12 Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops in Heart Mountain, in mm -hmm. the camp. And, um, and similar uh, social groups, uh, they had adult classes uh, to teach English to the mm -hmm. parents. Uh, so, so there were many, many activities going on uh, what else can you do in Wyoming, a desolate place? Well, you can go rock collecting. Uh, as young boys, I remember we used to go out uh, uh, capturing rattlesnakes and counting the number of rattle tails. Uh, and, and, and we do all kinds of crazy things, but, but mm -hmm. those are some of the things that we, had to, uh, we did in order to, uh, to make uh, useful, uh, uh, keep busy during our off times. But otherwise, it was really schoolwork, and a lot of schoolwork at that time. Were you allowed to have newspapers? Did you have radio? Were you yeah. aware of the outside of what was happening? Yeah, it's, that's another interesting aspect of the camps. Um, the government allowed us freedom to communicate. We were allowed to have a newspaper. We were allowed to have radios in the camp. Hmm. Um, we were allowed to subscribe to outside newspapers. Uh, there was no restrictions. Um, uh, but uh, so so we uh, we created a newspaper uh, called the Heart Mountain Sentinel, and it was very popular. Uh, 
very well written. Uh, in fact, it was so popular that we had subscribers from the local towns uh, subscribing to our camp newspaper. They would learn the world news on our newspaper that they wouldn't get in the local towns. Um, no, so we, we learned of um, uh, many, many things that happened in the world. We, we knew of the progress of the, of the, uh, the war in the Pacific as well as uh, Europe. Um, and uh, you know, that, was, uh, uh, that was an important part of life in the camp. We were allowed the freedom to communicate. Mm. Now, your dad, he was in newspapers. Did right. he have something to do with the Heart Mountain Sentinel? Well, not really. My father had a, another problem. Um, before, uh, before the war, uh, he developed a case of um, glaucoma, which is a disease of the eye in San Francisco. And uh, he was being treated by a specialist at that time. And at that time, um, they did not have medication like they do today. Uh, so they had to go through some procedures in order to make sure he could maintain his eyesight. Uh, and the specialist in San Francisco was able to do that. And I remember going into camp, he was able to see. But inside the camp, uh, there was no such skilled person. We, we did not have any physician who knew how to take care of uh, glaucoma. And as a result, he went blind in camp. He never saw again once he entered uh, Heart Mountain. Mm -hmm. and so when he went back home, he had to develop a, a totally different career, uh, which was difficult, but he, he was able to at least survive. Uh, one thing he did have, he, he, had, uh, he had an education from Japan in both English and, of course, in Japanese. And so um, he taught English to Japanese people, mm. uh, and he taught Japanese to people who wanted to learn Japanese. Mm. So he set up a small school, and that way he was able to survive and keep, keep life going for us. Uh, but that's one of the problems that we had in the camp. Even though there was a hospital there, that doesn't mean you're getting the quality of medical care that, that's so important. Um, my grandfather also died in the camp. Uh, he had a case of um, colon cancer, and it was very, very poorly treated. Uh, he suffered bad. Hmm. Yeah. Awful. I spoke with someone who said, I have no birthplace. I was born in an internment camp. Hmm. Uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm sure there, there were babies born at Heart Mountain. What about graduation? How is that handled? Well, uh, yeah, in terms of vital statistics, uh, there were uh, some 300 uh, babies born at Heart Mountain. Mm. Uh, all their birth certificates say born at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. There is no such place today, but it's <laughs> on the record of their birth certificates. Uh, and um, so these are the, the children of Heart Mountain. Uh, they were born at the hospital. The hospital was they had, did have a, a skilled staff uh, for more common mm. uh, needs, like um, uh, uh, births, uh, births and uh, also uh, uh, bro broken bones and other similar type of illnesses. But uh, they, they were not prepared to handle the specialty diseases. And, uh, and my father and my grandfather were totally disallowed from returning for medical help uh, to the California area. Again, oh. because of General DeWitt's orders. Uh, that no one of Japanese ancestry uh, were allowed back to the West Coast at all during that time. So they, they asked? They just. Oh, yes, there was yes. No uh, well, it, it, it was clear that uh, uh, I, I have a copy of my father's medical records and my grandfather's medical records, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, the local doctors uh, had, uh, had uh, obviously very, very limited knowledge on how to handle uh, special diseases and problems. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that, that is the most uh, difficult aspect of, of these camps. Uh, by having a facility, a building that's called a hospital, but not having the proper uh, mm -hmm. talented medical staff um, is, is really an inhumane uh, situation for us mm -hmm. that happened to, to many, many people uh, at these camps. I wonder if that issue was pushed afterwards, like you said, they didn't have the people with the credentials, so they brought in teachers, but they can't bring in specialists. Hmm. 
I don't know the reason why. Uh, maybe it was economics. Uh, maybe there was a limit as to how many uh, outsiders they could bring in. Um, mm. I, I don't know. But I do know for the fact that uh, medical skills were limited. Uh, teaching skills were limited, but that was solved at, at the uh, high school level. Um, and uh, so uh, it, was, it was a difficult time uh, for all of us. You know, the, the images of Dorothea Lange, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously very well known for Migrant Mother, you know, for the Great Depression pictures, but I'm really glad that you chose some of those images for um, this particular, for our, our presentation here today. Mm -hmm. Did you meet her? Uh, you, you'd said that she took a picture of the grade school, but um, I was just curious, there's, there's lots of photographers who were documenting this for the mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick her images? Well, um, if you studied the, the photographs of, of many of these professionals who were hired by the government to, to take these pictures, you will quickly see a, a, a huge contrast between the type of photographs that Dorothea Lang took as opposed to those photographs that Ansel Adams took. To give you some example, Ansel Adams took photographs of smiling prisoners, happy prisoners, of living quarters with luxurious living rooms and fully equipped kitchens. There was no such thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so why did he do that? Well, one reason is it was at the request of the government in those days to show that people inside these camps were being treated humanely. And he followed those orders. On the other hand, Dorothea Lang, amazing, amazing woman. You look at her photographs and they show emotions. They show kids you know, almost tearfully reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. You see children and babies wearing dog tags with their names and prisoner numbers as they were led to the buses that took us to the prison camps. You see armed guards escorting people to registration offices in Japantown. And you see hundreds of guards with weapons, making sure we get on that train to go to the permanent camps. I mean, these, this is reality. I, I was curious, why, why would Dorothy do such a thing when she was also asked to take pictures that make it look good uh, for the government? And, and I, I located her granddaughter. Uh, Dorothy had passed on uh, not too long after she took the pictures. But I talked to her granddaughter, she was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I said, why did your grandmother decide to take those pictures that show reality? And she said, that was grandma. Mm -hmm. She didn't believe in taking orders. When she saw a scene that is reality, people are suffering, it shows in their faces. That's what made her famous on these migrant mother photos. You can look at the picture with no caption and know that that family's in deep trouble during the Great Depression. You look at her pictures of the camp and you know that that was inhumane of having armed guards forcing us to board buses and trains to be carted off to prison camps. That's the reality and the accurate photos that, that she took. And, and whenever I, I uh, speak, I do speak sometimes at uh, photo exhibitions where they're showing photographs of Ansel Adams. And by the way, don't get me wrong, he, he's an outstanding landscape photographer. He took a beautiful picture of a camp with the, with the Sierra Mountains in the background and a monument at the cemetery at, in the Manzanar camp in California. But he didn't take one picture of a prison guard, of a guard tower, of a, of a, of a fence. He didn't take one picture of the difficulties that the family faced. And so uh, that's why I tend to focus on her works as being representative of uh, what happened uh, at the camps. Mm. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you did yep. because I, 
I appreciate Ansel Adams. He's a fantastic photographer, yeah. but Lang is my favorite because yeah. she does show reality. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really impressed that you went to see your granddaughter. I'm curious, did you ask her, did she get into trouble for taking those honest images? Well, that's an interesting topic because when the government realized with some of the photos, they, the first photos they looked at were armed guards forcing people to register. The word register, sound familiar today? And yeah. so her picture with an armed guard forcing our parents to register the families, they, the government saw these pictures and said, your entire collection of 1,000 photographs are impounded immediately. And they put them in a vault in UC Berkeley in the Bancroft Library and hidden for a long time until they were finally released. And I, was able, I got permission from Berkeley to be able to show these in my talks. Uh, and if I may quickly mention, I did put out a DVD of my presentation, which includes many of the photographs that Dorothy Lang took. And it's, it's such an important collection, and it shows the reality of what happened to us uh, during the camp. Mm. So and be sure to order my DVD. I was going to say, and I think we're going to put that up there because <laughs> I want a copy of your DVD. Um, we just have a few moments sure. left. Um, I know we, we've got a, a little bit of a video, but um, just quickly, when your family was released, and it was at the end of World War II. So you had been there for three very long years. How, how did that work? How did you fit back into society? You've been gone for three years. It was a difficult time for most people uh, of Japanese ancestry when they returned back home. The people in, in the residents of the people in California, Oregon, and Washington, most of them did not want us back. We were greeted with signs that says, keep moving, don't stop here. It, it, was, it was an awful condition. There was a lot of racial hatred. A lot of people could not find jobs. Uh, there were counties in California that passed a law that said Japanese are not allowed to farm in that county. And so I know families who had to change careers my father being blind, fortunately though, at least he had a brain. He knew how to survive that condition. And uh, even though he was blind, what he did was he, he could teach. You can teach while you're blind. And he taught uh, English uh, to Japanese people and he taught Japanese to people who wanted to learn Japanese. And so he set up a school um, and he wrote books. And, and so we were able to survive by using what he had left, which is his brains that he developed in college in Japan. Uh, but we were relatively fortunate. A lot of people didn't have that. Uh, uh, there's, there's a particular film that you're welcome to show, if you'd like, of, uh, of uh, one lady. Uh, her name is Toshi Ito, and her, her father could not re-enter the insurance business when he went back to uh, San Jose, California. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he committed suicide. And uh, Toshi uh, prepared a videotape of her being interviewed on her learning for the first time what happened to her father. A very emotional film, but it was courageous of her to do that. But a lot of people uh, had uh, similar stories, and they've asked me not to talk about it uh, in my lectures. And I honor that request, but Toshi is one that I use because she, she voluntarily wanted to make sure people know uh, the impact of racial hatred at its worst. And, and she had a very, very sad story to talk about. And, and so, uh, but we, we worked hard. Uh, I was busy in, in middle school and high school trying to get to college. And, uh, and our parents uh, encouraged us to continue getting our education and uh, my chosen field was engineering. I became a rocket scientist for the Boeing company, which I've enjoyed thoroughly uh, before retiring, retiring from Boeing. And then I, I turned to teaching. And I'm now lecturing around the country, uh, all over the country, about uh, what happened uh, to us, uh, primarily using the photographs of Dorothea Lange. So it, it's uh, become a very, very popular uh, talk. I'm, I'm quite busy. My calendar is almost full for the next couple of years. And uh, I, yeah. uh, I enjoy doing it, so that works out fine. Yeah, I peaked. Before you, you honored us here, you had 15 presentations, 
and after you leave here, you have 25 more <laughs> the rest of this year. Um, before we go, I, I would like to go ahead and show that video of Toshi Ito. Not being able to provide for his family left him desperate. And so he committed suicide. <sighs> he finally figured out that if he committed suicide, uh, my mother and I would be taken care of because uh, she would get the premiums, I mean the money from the insurance. It happened when Toshi was a newlywed on her honeymoon. She received a call that her father was sick and she needed to come home. She remembers stepping off that train and being told what really happened. I just, just started to cry. And I went to my mother and I hugged her and I said, I'm so sorry, you know. And then when I got home, I went to his bed and on the side he slept and I just lay there and I cried and I could smell his hair tonic that he wore and uh, I never cried so much in my life. <sighs> so to wrap up today, which has been very enlightening, um, you are now uh, instrumental in the restoration of Heart Mountain Prison Camp. You're on the board of the foundation how did that happen? And I'm just curious, where do you see your future role for the internment camp memory? You know, the, the people who were at the, the campsite, both the prisoners as well as the local people, uh, realized there's a need to do something that's more permanent, try to create uh, something out of this entire experience and a uh, decision was made to create a uh, a learning center uh, I call it a school uh, and we bring in all kinds of people but mostly young people uh, at uh, middle school high school level and we bring them in by buses we created a school so we bring them in in a unique facility, it's right on the prison site, and we give them a tour of the prison site, and then we, we take them through the school uh, on a day tour, and go, they go in through the school and learn about what happened in that camp, and learn about uh, civil rights, that all of these kids uh, need to learn that lesson, and, uh, and it's really a growing activity we have uh, at, that, at that camp right now. And sadly, today, it's timely. Yeah, I, I would like to mention that's probably the most important um, aspect of the experience that we all had, um, and that is the, what, are the, what are the lessons learned out of this experience? Well, it, you know, most likely it will not happen again to, to people of Japanese ancestry, but it almost happened in 1942 to German Americans. It almost happened to the Italian Americans. But fortunately for them, the decision was made not to do that. In our case, it happened to the Japanese Americans on the West Coast, but it could happen today to other people. And especially when I hear people say things like that World War II experience of placing Japanese into these prison camps is a precedence. It's an, a good example of what can be done. And when I hear that, it really, really bothers me because some people will listen to that and assume that this process, such as registration of a minority, of a race, of a religion, is, is something that can be done. And, and, and that's the lesson that we learned out of this process, that it should never happen to anybody. Um, and, uh, and that theme uh, should continue to be told uh, uh, to everyone uh, in this country. Absolutely. Well, it has been an honor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank very, you much. I appreciate much. it. Thank you very much. 
If you have comments or questions about the program, please email us at metrovision at mccneb.edu. Thanks for watching.